Hey guys, there's a monster in your state. What? What am I talking about? Well, if you live in the United States, there has been an alleged monster sighting or Native American mythology, folklore, or cryptid if you will, in every single U.S. state. And today, I'm going to be talking about each and every one of these in every single U.S. state. So if you live in the United States, you're going to hear one that's relative to you. First up, I just want to say thank you guys for 15k subs. I don't know how it happened so quick, but it truly is a blessing, so thank you guys. I've been doing a lot of TikTok videos, which is cringe. I really want to get more on YouTube just because it's so much better. I feel like you can go more in depth with a lot of stuff, and you can really connect with the audience and talk about it. Just have, just have general conversations about weird and interesting stuff that we all enjoy. So if you like this stuff, hit subscribe because we're going to be having a lot more videos on here. Anyways, without further ado, let's get into it. What does ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, ancient Rome all have in common? That's right, really cool mythology. And you might think living here in the United States, oh, we don't have any. Well, we do. The mythology I'm talking about is more recent mythology, or what some might call cryptids. But there are also a lot of ancient legends too. A lot of these legends come from Native American mythology, or stories that were told around the campfire with lumberjacks, or just word of mouth stories that sound insane. So take these stories with a grain of salt, but they are super interesting. And we're going to start in the southwest region and work all the way around. First up, we have the New Mexico Territorns. In July 19th, 2007, there was a New Mexico resident named Dave Zander who said he saw two enormous bird-like creatures with wingspans of at least 20 feet wide gliding along the Oregon Mountains. What's interesting is there's been other alleged sightings of these creatures all throughout New Mexico since the 1800s. A cryptozoologist named Ken Gerhard said that he believes the creatures that were spotted were a raptor-like bird called the Teratorns, which was a real bird that lived in that area roughly 6,000 years ago. This bird also had a 20-foot wingspan and could weigh up to 120 pounds. Some that are really into it say that this could also maybe be a pterodactyl, but I mean, those suckers are so old, that would be insane. Which others think that these creatures are linked to Native American mythology about the Thunderbird, which is something I'll get into later in this video. Other than that sighting, I don't have a whole lot for that one, so let's move on to the next one. We've got the Oklahoma Octopus. After a large number of disappearances and drownings in Oklahoma lakes, some residents have turned to an unusual explanation. This comes from a legend about a strange aquatic creature with a desire for human flesh. They describe it as being a red octopus the size of a horse with shark teeth. This creature is said to inhabit the freshwater lakes in Oklahoma, including Lake Thunderbird, Uloga Lake, and Lake Tenkiller, where it's said to attack and drown swimmers. There's no physical evidence of its existence, but many point to the high death rates in these lakes as being because of the octopus. Some even say that Lake Thunderbird is extremely red because of the creature's color coming off in the water. This lake has red dirt in it. Anyways, uh, also if you watch the Lost Tape show, there was an episode about the Oklahoma octopus. That show was really awesome. Moving on to Texas, we have the Chupacabra. The Chupacabra is either described as looking more like a mangy dog or more like a reptilian alien-like thing. Stories of it originated in the 1990s in Puerto Rico after a bunch of goats were found bloodless like a vampire had sucked the blood out of them, granting it the name Goat Sucker. So in this area of Puerto Rico, there was over 200 alleged sightings of people reporting that they saw a creature described as being short, bipedal, red-eyed, and having spiny things down its back. And for some reason, this started a conspiracy theory about how either the US government or aliens were collecting blood to spread AIDS. I don't know why. Anyway, so later in the early 2000s, chupacabras started being reported throughout Texas. And in 2011, police got footage of what many believe is the dog-like chupacabra. But others say this is just a coyote hybrid with mange. But I mean, still, why not? Why is Why does it not have to be a chupacabra? Maybe a chupacabra is just a coyote with mange and it has abilities or something. Anyways, moving on to Arizona, we have the Magion Monster. This is an awesome one. It's described as being an ape-like creature similar to Bigfoot, but it's sometimes white or reddish brown and has two inch long claws. So according to the Native American legend, there's two scenarios on how it was created. It was either created when an exiled chief was transformed by the local medicine man as a punishment, or because a white man who attacked and killed a Native American woman was hung by a tree from his hands and stretched to the height of eight feet and then he was damned by the spirits to now roam the woods as a misnamed skinwalker. 
The oldest known reported sighting was in 1903 when a man described an encounter along the Grand Canyon. He claimed when he discovered it, it was drinking the blood of two cougars and it threatened him with a club while making a wild unearthly screech. So it's like he walked up on this Bigfoot looking thing that had apparently killed two mountain lions and it was like a man and a monkey with a giant club and then it screamed at him so that's that's pretty terrifying another popular story involves the arizona pioneer sam spade who said while he was building a log cabin along the Magion rim that he was attacked by the creature and he survived but later his son bill and bill's soon-to-be wife were killed by the creature on their wedding day they think the reason they killed him was because the Magion monster was bent on revenge due to stolen land. I believe that was a pioneer story also. Alright, the Alaska Tisaruk. Also known as the Loch Ness Monster of Alaska, the Tisaruk is a mythical creature from Inuit religion. It's described as being a 15 to 30 foot long sea serpent and having a flipper like a fish. It's said to inhabit the sub-Arctic waters near Key Island in Alaska in the Bering Sea. Some also believe that this creature is what Stellar's sea ape may have been, which Stellar was an explorer and when he was exploring he saw this crazy apish dog looking sea monster and that this old sailor wrote about seeing it in the Gulf of Alaska in the 1700s. And he saw it for a long period of time. He saw it for like an hour and he said he documented everything it did. It was a very strange occurrence. It was like a one-off thing. Anyways, the Tisaruk is said by some to kill hunters. And Alaskans and local Inuit people claim that it snatched people off of piers while they're fishing without them even noticing its presence. In 2009, a fisherman got a video of what many believe is a Tisaruk. I think this is a really cool creature. It's got quite a few sightings in the area, and surprisingly, it's not in the Alaskan Triangle, which, if you don't know, that's an area between Barrow, Anchorage, and another place. Uh, but anyway, it's just an area where weird things happen, and a lot of people go missing. Moving on, even further south, we have Hawaii. Hawaii has a lot of really cool legends. Uh, but none as famous as the Menahune. The Menahune of Hawaii are said to be a mythological race of dwarf people in Hawaiian tradition. They are said to live in the deep forest in hidden valleys of the Hawaiian Islands in areas that are hidden far away from human settlements. They're said to be able to be seen by children and that humans are not able to see them unless they have a special connection with them. It's said they only come out at night and that they're incredible at building things such as temples, fish ponds, roads, canoes, houses. Today there's still structures that stand that many say was built by the Menhune, such as the fish ponds and then also this wall I believe. But despite there being no clear physical evidence of Menahune, a census was taken in 1820 that listed that 65 residents of the Hawaiian island of Kauai were Menahune. That's pretty nuts. I don't know if those people maybe said they were Menahune or if colonizers came in and they're like, they're short, they're Menahune. You never know. California. These horrifying creatures are the Dark Watchers. This is a phenomenon that's very unexplained. A lot of people in California, um, from what I've seen, they all talk about how they see relatively the same thing. It's these dark figures that are like 15 feet tall, they're shadowy looking, they have no facial features, and they're often seen wearing hats and just standing and staring in the distance. They're often said to vanish if the one staring at them blinks. Kind of like weeping angels. Except I don't think they attack you. I think they're peaceful, as far as I know. The native Chumash tribe of California's central coast said that they've been seeing these figures for thousands of years, and they refer to the Dark Watchers as the Old Ones, even though they've been there for thousands of years. The tribe, I mean. They're most often reported being seen at night, watching travelers from the horizon of the Santa Lucia mountain range. According to legend, no one has seen them up close, and that they actually disappear if you get close to them. Honestly, it's crazy how many people have said that they've seen them. I did a video earlier about them, and I had like six people comment that were from California and said that they'd seen them, so it's a big phenomenon. Moving on to Nevada. If you've been to Lake Tahoe, have you heard of Tahoe Tessie? So stories of Tahoe Tessie stretch back to the legends told by the Washu tribes and Paiute tribes in the area. It's been described as looking like a serpent-like monster or a gigantic eel or even a plesiosaur, which some say that it may actually be a surviving mosasaur. 
uh, just because there's a lot of fossils in that area, in the Nevada desert area, uh, close to Lake Tahoe. Other theories say that it may be a population of sturgeon or a new species of freshwater eel. But the legend has it that this serpent-like monster has lived in a cave beneath the lake and that's what's allowed it not to be seen. And sightings of this 80 foot long serpent known as Tahoe Tessie continue to this day. I even read a report where some divers actually went down and claimed that they saw something huge coming out of a cave underwater in Lake Tahoe. But all of this is just word of mouth, so. In Oregon, we have another water monster. It's Colossal Clawed. It's said by one onlooker to have a head like a camel, coarse gray fur, and to be roughly 40 feet long. A famous sighting was in 1939 by halibut fishermen who claimed that they all saw Colossal Clawed only 10 feet from their ship in the Columbian River as it stole and ate halibut off of their fishing lines. That would be really frustrating. Later in 1963, the Shell Oil Company got video of something just off the coast of Oregon that was 15 feet long and had barnacles ridged down its back. So they got this video of this thing. Many believe it was Colossal Clawed just because it was 180 feet below and people started calling it Marvin the Monster for some reason. Others say that it was probably a whale or some sort of weird jellyfish. I think it could have been a whale, but others believe it was also a surviving plesiosaur, which is a thing you're gonna see later in this video. There's a lot of plesiosaurs. Washington, can you guess what this one is? Go to the comments and comment what you think Washington's is. No cheating. Okay. Yeah, it's Bigfoot. So to start off, there's various other creatures allegedly inhabiting different regions of the world, such as the skunk ape of Florida slash the southeast of the United States the Yeti of Asia, and the Yawi of Australia. Some believe that all these creatures are connected in that that they are a Gigantopithecus, which the Gigantopithecus was in South Asia, and it's very possible, in my opinion, it's very possible the Gigantopithecus could have migrated over into the Himalayan areas and scared the heck out of some people over there. And I feel like that's where the legend of the Yeti comes from, that either people got scared of the Yeti and they pass that story down for generations just to warn people or anyways the Gigantopithecus was a giant extinct ape that stood at 10 feet tall. The Sasquatch or Bigfoot's fame can be traced back hundreds of years to Native American legends. On the Thule River Indian Reservation in California there's actually 500 to 1000 year old petroglyphs which are these rock carvings that look to depict a group of Bigfoots and this picture is called the family it's really crazy because it, it really does look like Bigfoots. However, the earliest written account was in 1811 by a guy named David Thompson who was mapping the regions in Canada and the United States. This is a really interesting story. He said that a local Native American tribe named the Spokans believed in a hairy race of giants that lived in a nearby mountain and that they would often come into their camps and steal their salmon or even take people from their tribe while they were asleep. And Thompson said that these giants left footprints of one and a half feet long. The original name for Bigfoot actually came from an incident in 1958 where a group of loggers kept discovering these human-like 16-inch foot long footprints around their job site in California. They also kept having these 450-pound oil drums just like thrown around their job site without any explanation. But Bigfoot is by far the most famous cryptid in the United States, if not the world. The Loch Ness Monster might have it beat, I'm not sure. In Idaho, some of the region's native people have long feared an evil spirit dwelling deep in Big Payette Lake. And throughout the 1900s, there was many reports of a dinosaur-like creature that was first named Slimy Slim before a local newspaper had a contest to find a better name for it, or they all ended up calling it Charlie. Charlie is described as being a 35 foot long creature that looks like a dinosaur, has a dinosaur-like head, humps like a camel, and shell-like skin. And I think some people think that this picture is real of it, but Charlie was reported to be sighted dozens of times between 1956 and the last documented sighting in 2002. Utah. So Utah is the home of the Bear Lake Monster. It's described as resembling a 50 foot long serpent, but with short legs and a head like a crocodile, kind of like a Mosasaurus. Stories of this cryptid grew in the late 1800s after Joseph Rich, a Mormon colonizer, 
published it in the local newspaper. Gotta believe those Mormon colonizers, they are very truthful. In his newspaper, Joseph offered a prize to anyone who could capture the Bear Lake monster, but later he admitted that it was all a story uh, that was a lie to attract tourism in the area. However, there was something similar sighted in that area after this incident that was reported in 2007. I have no information other than that. There's not much on it. Montana. Quick disclaimer, this monster is real, kind of. Whether it's a not monster or not is up for debate. So in 1886, a rancher killed and mounted this wolf-like thing which had been pestering the local natives for generations. In this area in Montana, there is a legend about a large wolf hyena-looking thing that is known as Shunkawarakin, or Shunkawarakin, I don't, honestly, I can't figure out how to pronounce it, there's not hardly anything on it, which that name means carries off dogs because it was said to enter the camp and just absolutely wipe out people's dogs or steal them off. Maybe to breed, I don't know, or to eat. This creature was known around the region to terrorize the surrounding counties in Montana for many years. It's attributed with killing a grand total of 120 sheep, and many believe it was possibly a leftover dire wolf from the Ice Age. Witnesses who got a good look at the Shunkawarakin described it as being nearly black, having high shoulders, kind of like a hyena, and then also having a back that sloped downward, which is also like a hyena. Today, the owner of the stuffed creature refuses to have the Shunkawarakin DNA tested, so the monster part still remains a mystery, and you can actually still go see it in the Madison Valley History Museum in Montana. I think I'm gonna have to go see that one day. Maybe he can tell me how to pronounce it. Wyoming, we have the jackalope. Of course. This is another cryptid that's technically confirmed real in a way. So the jackalope is rumored to be an antlerless species of rabbit that was a cross between a pygmy deer and a killer rabbit from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know what the killer rabbit is. I, I couldn't find any information on that one either. It was said to be very vicious, run at 90 miles an hour, and that the cowboys even used to report them mimicking their voices and singing along with them around the campfire. And it's said that the jackalope could only be caught if you put out a flask of whiskey at night for it, and the jackalope would drink it all and get drunk and then make it easier to hunt. And you might ask, why would you want to hunt the jackalope? Well, part of this legend is that the jackalope meat is really good, that it tastes like lobster, and that also, if you can milk the female jackalope, its milk has a variety of medicinal purposes. But besides all that legendary stuff, there actually is a true explanation for the existence of a horned rabbit. The horns reported to be seen on rabbits may actually be a cancerous tumor known as Shope papilloma. I think I pronounced that right. This is a warty cancer thing that if it persists, it looks like antlers kind of. Pretty gross, but I couldn't imagine cowboys seeing that and being like, man, I want to eat that. This is my favorite one. The Slide Rock Bolter. This is a story that I don't feel like is talked about enough. It's like you have an awesome state, Colorado, you know, it's a great place, lots of mountains, and a really cool folkloric creature. You would think that they would like make a bunch of tourist jokes about it, uh, but no one really does. The story of the Slide Rock Bolter came from North American lumberjack camps in the 1800s, which if you don't know, the lumberjacks really like to tell these crazy stories while they're around the campfire. Um, it was like a form of entertainment for them while they were out on the job. According to the folklore told by them, the bolter was believed to live in the mountains of Colorado, but not just on any mountains, only mountains that have a 45 degree slope or greater. It was described as having an immense head, small eyes, and a gigantic mouth. It was also said to have a tail like a dolphin with enormous grab hooks and looking similar to a giant whale. All day long, this creature would just wait for a tourist or a helpless animal to go below it and right at the right moment, it would lift up its tail, loosen its hold on the mountain and descend rapidly down the slope with its mouth wide open, swallowing everything that was in its path. Trees, rocks, people, anything. Legend has it, whole parties of tourists were reported to be gulped up in one scoop. Then when it got to the bottom of the mountain, it would use its own momentum to get to the top of another mountain. So, the story of the Slide Rock Bolter and its demise. According to folklore, a forest ranger whose district was the rough country between Ophir Peaks and Lizardhead was concerned for the safety of the people in their area, and they got the bold idea of decoying the Slide Rock Bolter to its own destruction. He fastened a dummy tourist, dressed it in a Norfolk jacket, knee breeches, and a guidebook to Colorado. And I guess this is what tourists looked like at the time. Then he filled it with giant powder and fulminate caps and posted it in a conspicuous place where sure enough, 
The next day, it attracted the attention of the slide rock bolter, which had been hanging for days on the slope of Lizardhead. The bolter ended up sliding down and eating the dummy and just blowing up and going everywhere. The resulting explosion was said to flatten half the buildings in Rico, Colorado, which has never been rebuilt. It was also said that the surrounding hills fed flocks of buzzards for the rest of the summer because of how much meat came off of the bolter. Lumberjacks say that since this incident, no sightings have occurred, but some believe it still thrives in the Colorado Rockies. Moving on to North Dakota, the Thunderbird. The Thunderbird is a legendary creature that's considered to be a supernatural being of power and strength. Stories in oral history have been taught in the Pacific Northwest Coast to the American Southwest, East Coast, Great Lake, Great Plains, pretty much Everywhere in North America, they talk about the Thunderbird. Legend says that the Thunderbird was a benevolent spirit that was so large and powerful that when it flapped its wings, thunder was created, lightning flashed in its eyes, and water fell off the backs, creating rain. It's said that they are the enemy of the Great Horned Snakes, and that because of this, it prevented the Great Horned Snakes from overrunning the world and devouring all of mankind, according to the Mennonome tribe in northern Wisconsin. There's also a really cool story from the Pacific Northwest tribes about how the Thunderbird saved them from this killer whale. To summarize the story, the Quailute tribe's main food source was whale hunting, and they got a lot of resources from that. It's what they survived on. And what happened was there was an evil orca, they said, that was killing other whales and making them all starve. So when the Thunderbird saw this from high up on the mountains, it flew down over the ocean, plunged in the water, and tried to seize the whale. When this happened, a great struggle ensued, and the ocean receded, and then rose again, and that ended up killing many people, according to the legend. But eventually, the Thunderbird succeeded in lifting the whale out of the ocean and dropped it onto the land, where it actually had another fight with the whale which it ended up winning because it had an advantage. Some historians believe that the legend of the Thunderbird is based on discoveries of petrosaur fossils by the Native Americans. Super cool legend, I love that one. South Dakota. In South Dakota, there's been many reports of something like a Bigfoot, except it wears a hat. It's called Takuhi, and honestly, there's just not a lot about it. Uh, but in the 1970s, there was at least a dozen sightings of this sandy-colored Sasquatch. It was said to normally either be staring creepily at witnesses or dragging cattle from pastures because it was said to eat a lot of cows. Also, some people would say that it wore a coat and a top hat. I don't know why. Maybe it was like a metaphor for like people invading their land. Nebraska, we got the Alcali Lake Monster. So the Alcali Lake Monster is widely believed to be a hoax to sell newspapers. It's described as a giant brown alligator with a rhinoceros horn on its nose, and it's said to be between 40 and 100 feet long. The main sighting of this thing claims that this horned alligator was seen attacking a car next to Alcali Lake in northwest Nebraska. And the people in Nebraska actually believed this wholeheartedly for a long time, uh, but later, when the attention died down, the publisher of the newspaper came out and said the whole thing was a hoax. So sad. Kansas, we got Sinkhole Sam. Sinkhole Sam is this worm-like creature that's said to inhabit part of Inman Lake in Kansas known as the Sinkhole. So before America was colonized by the Europeans, Kansas was covered by small streams and rivers, uh, but since it's been blocked up and dried out, only leaving a few natural lakes and streams. Locals theorized that Sam was actually a prehistoric creature that lived in flooded underground caverns and it somehow migrated to the sinkhole in Inman Lake to survive. The first sighting was from two men who were fishing at the sinkhole in 1950. They described it as being 15 feet long and as round as a car tire. That's a big worm! Ten years later, in 1960, a sighting of a similar creature was reported 50 miles south in Kingman State Park of a snake that was so large that a tractor tire couldn't run over it. And because of this, a large search ensued for this giant snake, but no snake other than native species was found. Um, but in that Kingman State Park area, there's been all kinds of weird creatures reported. They reported Bigfoot, Mothman, mysterious figures in trench coats, which is kind of like Mothman. But it's just a strange area, I guess. This is definitely the creepiest one, Minnesota. The most famous cryptid in Minnesota is the Wendigo. The Wendigo is a human-eating cannibalistic spirit. In modern day, it's depicted as having these antlers on its head, but according to Native American mythology, it does not. 
It's described as more resembling a zombie looking thing or a corpse, having a skeleton like thin body with gray skin, sunken eyes, bloody lips, yellow fangs, and a long slimy tongue. In some forms, the Wendigo is said to be the size of a human, while others it can be up to 15 feet tall. It's said to bring death and destruction wherever it goes, and if it gets close to you, you start to feel a cold chill all throughout your body. According to legend, a person becomes a Wendigo either when they are overpowered by greed, or if they resort to cannibalism to survive. It's said that once an individual is a Wendigo, that they have an insatiable hunger for human flesh, and that they can change their voice to mimic others and sound like someone you know, to make you try to get close to it. This is the creepiest real incident that I'll talk about. There's a famous case that's deemed by many to be a Wendigo possession, which I will warn you before I talk about this one, it's pretty creepy, so skip to the next one if you don't want to be freaked out. In the winter of 1878, a Plains Cree trapper from Alberta named Swift Runner suffered one of the worst cases known to anyone. Him and his family were starving due to a brutal winter. Basically, what happened was his oldest son died due to starvation, and to avoid starvation himself, Swift ate his deceased son, which many say made him have Wendigo psychosis. Swift ended up killing the remaining six family members in his family and eating them too. Not long after he ate his entire family, he was captured and sentenced to death. It's pretty interesting, I did research on this fairly recently about Wendigo psychosis, and there was an article that talked about how Wendigo psychosis was debated in the medical field fairly recently around the 80s, um, but I tried to find an article to, again to link it down at the bottom, but I couldn't find it, so. Moving on to Iowa, we have the Van Meter Monster. Some call it the Van Meter Visitor. I like, I prefer the Van Meter Monster. So there was a string of strange events that occurred in 1903 in Van Meter, Iowa, when several respected prominent men of the area of Van Meter reported seeing a half human, half animal with enormous bat wings flying around and terrorizing residents during a span of several nights. Descriptions from those who saw the beast said that it had large bat wings, had a terrible smell wherever it went, and that it fired beams of light from its forehead. It had a horn there, kind of like a pterodactyl. So the story goes on, the locals shot at the beast multiple times, but the bullets didn't affect it for some reason. Finally, after realizing that they couldn't shoot it to kill it, a group of townsfolk banded together one evening and chased the creature into an abandoned coal mine. There at the coal mine, they said that they were confronted by two beasts, one the original and then a smaller version of the original. And then this is where a news reporter reported this. The noise opened up again as though Satan and a regiment of imps were coming forth for battle. Talking about the creature. Then it says that the men chased them and shot at them so many times that they said they would think it would sink the Spanish fleet. And then the monsters escaped into the mine shafts, never to be seen or heard of again. This one's kind of different because a lot of these incidences come from just random words of mouth and whatever, but this one comes from these really prominent men and everybody who heard the story was extremely surprised that they told such a crazy story because they would not want the publicity from it. They were really reliable men. Missouri. We've got Momo the Monster. Also known as the Missouri Monster, eyewitnesses describe this creature as a large ape-like humanoid that was seven feet tall, covered in dark hair that emits a putrid odor. The most famous sighting of Momo occurred in 1971 near Louisiana, Missouri, when two young boys were playing in their backyard and their sister heard them screaming. When she walked to the back of her house and looked out the window, she said she saw a massive dark-haired man-like creature holding a dead dog. She said it had a pumpkin-shaped head and large glowing orange eyes. Some suggest it was possibly a rogue black bear. Uh, but there aren't really any other notable sightings of this creature. Maybe it was just someone trying to scare them. But there was kind of a sighting where someone got tracks that they said, because they said it has three toes, and they got these three-toed tracks and gave it to the Oklahoma City Zoo. Um, but they said it was a hoax, so. Wisconsin, we have the Beast of Bray Road. Basically, there's this road in Wisconsin called Bray Road where many people have reported seeing these overly large wolf-like creatures and they have really strange encounters with them. So there's quite a few sightings, mainly in the 90s, 
where people would say they saw this bear wolf hybrid or werewolf looking thing or dog man along this road. Some say it was just an escaped pet or a feral dog or maybe just a bear. But most of the encounters end with the witness getting scratches down the side of their vehicle by the beast. Insurance fraud. Some people even claim that this is a real picture of it. But yeah, there was also a low budget movie on it, um, and there was also an episode of The Lost Tapes about it too. Illinois, we had the Enfield Monster, also known as the Enfield Horror. Eyewitnesses say that this thing was like an alien demon genetic mutation. Uh, it was a pretty weird thing. They described it as having this grayish colored skin, uh, looking like a humanoid with three legs, a short body, pink eyes, and two little arms, kind of like a T-Rex. The first sighting was in 1973, when two children were at home when they were attacked by it. And then after they ran into their house and locked the door, they said it tried to break in. When their dad, McDaniel, got home, he heard the story from them and he was like, what? But then he started hearing scratches at the door, which he grabbed his gun, as he should, and he opened up the door where he saw what he thought was a bear. But then he realized it had three legs and it was more like a monster. And he believed that it was not from this planet. So McDaniel said that he just opened fire on it and that he immediately shot it. But instead of falling to the ground, it hissed like a wildcat and then jumped 50 feet in just three leaps before disappearing into the woods. After researchers at Western Illinois University analyzed the incident and two other first-hand encounters of this creature, they deemed that the reports were possibly a kangaroo. Maybe one that was escaped from the zoo, I don't know, that's... I mean, I, I, it could maybe be a kangaroo, I don't know. Michigan, we have the Michigan Dog Man. Truly great lumberjack story. So in 1887, there was a pair of lumberjacks that were chasing this dog around, and they chased it into a corner and poked it with a stick, which at that point, the dog looked at them and then stood up on its hind legs, showing itself to be in fact a dog man or man dog, if you like. Like all good boys, this dog man thing was perfectly peaceful, but the woodsmen still ran away in terror. It was a good boy though. They described what became known as the Michigan dog man, as it was seven feet tall, had blue eyes, canine-like animal with the torso of a man and that it had a creepy howl that sounds like a human scream. Later in 1937, in Paris, Michigan, a man was attacked by five wild dogs, and he said that one of the five dogs stood up and walked on its hind legs. And similar reports happened in 1867. According to legends, the Michigan Dog Man only appears in a 10-year cycle and years ending in seven. Sightings have been reported in several locations throughout Michigan, primarily in the northwestern quadrant in the Lower Peninsula. Northwestern. Is that right? Or is it this way? After doing more research, this creature actually did come from Native American mythology, where the Manistee tribe talks about a creature like this that's been stalking the area since the days of the Ottawa tribes, which is a long time ago. Indiana. If you don't know, in the late 1940s, thousands of people came from all across the country to a little town called Churubusco, Indiana. Why did they do that? It's to witness the attempted capture of a Volkswagen-sized lake monster that was essentially a giant snapping turtle. Yeah, so the story goes, in 1898, there was a farmer who saw this giant snapping turtle in his lake near his farm. No big deal about that one. But half a century later, in 1940, two people reported seeing a huge turtle that was 500 pounds in the same lake. Which, turtles live a long time, I mean... Which, when word got out about this, this led to mobs of people traveling there to see it be captured or to capture it themselves. They tried everything to capture it. They made a huge net, they drained part of the lake, and they even introduced a pretty lady turtle into the lake, but it didn't help. They didn't end up catching the turtle. But what is cool is to this day in Churubusco, Indiana, there is still a festival in the turtle's memory. There's their parade. I really want to go, that's awesome. According to Ohio folklore, the Frogman was first spotted in 1955 by a traveling Bible salesman who was driving home at night when he saw three men crouched in the road. He stopped his car and honked at the men, and they turned around and looked at him and stood up on their hind legs. And he realized they were actually frogs. Imagine seeing these three giant frog creatures turn around and stare at you while you're trying to get home. Like, what were they doing? 
So later in 1972, a police officer in Loveland, Ohio reported seeing a humanoid frog cross in front of his car. He described it as being 4 feet tall, 60 pounds, and having leathery skin. He first spotted it, crouched like a frog, before it also stood up erect like a human to climb over the guardrail towards the river. Two weeks after this incident, a second police officer who was that guy's friend reported seeing an unidentified animal crouched in the road in the same area. But instead of waiting for it to stand up, he shot it and brought it back to the other officer. When he showed it to the other officer, it was actually a large iguana that was missing its tail and was probably an escaped pet. Sally's going to be really sad that her iguana just got shot, but at least the frogman mystery is solved. Except later in 2016, two kids were playing Pokemon Go and they were out hunting a Pikachu in Loveland, Ohio when they claim they saw a giant frog near the lake and that it stood up and walked on its hind legs. Guess you can't catch them all. Anyways, that is all of the Midwest states. Moving on to the Northeast, we have Maine with the Spectre Moose. So if you guys have ever been up north, you know, people are like really nice. Well, in Maine, even their monsters are nice. So if you're from Maine, I don't know if you've heard of the Spectre Moose, but it's a legend about a giant white moose that's almost transparent and that it's 15 feet tall and has antlers that are 12 feet across with 22 points on each side. Woo! The story of the Spectre Moose started in 1891 when it was first seen by a hunting guide near Lobster Lake in Maine. Then it was sighted shortly after by a hunter who tried to shoot it. This hunter said he fired shotgun slugs at it, but they had no effect and actually bounced off of the moose. And uh, then the moose charged him. I feel like he just missed and he just was embarrassed. The next year, a hunter in New York named Howard was hunting when he also shot at a huge moose. He hit the moose, allegedly, and that it weighed a ton and was as tall as a camel and that once again, the moose was not harmed by the shots and that it charged him. A little bit later, 1899, the moose became famous because the New York Times published an article about the moose and all of its sightings. And this goes on, there's a few other sightings, pretty much the same thing happens in Maine and the surrounding states. But the locals are quite serious about this moose. They say that it appears before something bad happens sometimes, kind of like Mothman, uh, which is nice. For instance, allegedly in 2002, they had a white moose sighting in Franklin, Maine, right before the town's restaurant burned down, which was like the only restaurant in the town. There was also a mission in Red Dead Redemption 2 where you get to hunt the Spectre Moose, and it was really cool. New Hampshire, we had the Woods Devil. Honestly, this one was pretty creepy. Um, there's not a whole lot of information on it, but it's a creepy legend. Also known as the Woods Devil of Coos County, some people say that it could either be a single Bigfoot or a group of Bigfoots, that have been roaming the woodlands of New Hampshire since 1930. These woods devils are said to be really skinny, be between 7 and 9 feet tall, have this shaggy, tannish gray hair all over them, and just look overall horrifying. I mean, look at that thing. What's even more horrifying is that they're said to have similar behavior to the hide behind, which if you don't know what that is, it's like this creature that anytime you look in its direction, it just hides behind something, and that it's always close to you, but you can never see it. It's like a paranoia thing. It's also said that it can blend in really well pretty much anywhere and that if it stands still, you can't see it. It just like looks like a tree. Hikers in the area of Coos County have been saying they've been hearing the creature's screams since the 1930s. There's this other story about how it's possibly the offspring of a Bigfoot and Wendigo. No. Unless. All right, Vermont, we have the Northfield Pigman. So there's an urban legend about a boy named Sam Harris who went missing in Vermont. And the story goes that he either became the Pigman or that he was eaten by a monster who was the Pigman. So a little backstory, there was this weird kid named Sam Harris who liked to slaughter pigs and carve out its head and wear the head of the dead pig over his face to terrorize people in Northfield, Vermont. There was also a rumor that along with wearing the pig's head that he would also lie with the pigs and that maybe the pig man was a result of his offspring. So he disappeared all of a sudden in 1951 and a couple years after his disappearance some high school kids were hanging out behind the school when they saw this thing walking towards them. It had two human legs and it was naked and had a pig face. This was likely a Halloween story to scare kids, but others think that it is a real pig-man hybrid or even a cannibalistic Bigfoot. 
Moving on to Massachusetts, the Dover Demon of Massachusetts. This creature was the subject of an intensive scare in the 1970s where three separate witnesses said they saw it. There's not much of a story to it, just three separate 17 year olds that were in the area of Dover said they spotted this creature gallivanting in the woods. The Dover Demon was described as looking like a gray alien except having more of an orangish tan colored skin and that it had a large head and small stick-like body and was only four feet tall, which is kind of like gray aliens anyways. Here's a drawing from one of the witnesses who saw the Dover Demon. They said they didn't feel like they were in danger, but they were terrified. Some say the Dover Demon could have possibly been a lost baby moose or even an escaped monkey from the zoo. Don't you hate it whenever you see an alien, but it just ends up being a moose? Rhode Island. The Marcy Brown Vampire Incident of Rhode Island. This is more of a legend or like legendary story than a cryptid. This is one of the best documented cases of people doing a ritual to banish an undead manifestation according to Wikipedia, which can never be wrong. This incident was also part of the wider New England vampire panic. Basically in the late 1800s, a farmer named George Brown kept having his family members die without explanation. First, poor George's wife died, followed by his daughter Mary, and then his daughter Mercy Brown. Because of all these deaths, friends and neighbors of George's family believed that one of the family members was actually a vampire, one of the dead family members. And keep in mind at this time, it was fairly ordinary to link multiple deaths in one family to an undead activity uh, just because of the folklore in this area. So George Brown was then persuaded by these friends and family to give permission to make sure the bodies of his loved ones were actually dead. When some of the villagers checked the body of his wife and his other daughter, they were decomposing as normal, but then when they got to his daughter Mercy Brown, it exhibited almost no decomposition and had blood still in her heart. This was taken as a sign that she was in fact an undead vampire and that she was causing the strange deaths. So they did what any normal person would do, and they burned her heart and liver, mixed it with water to create a tonic, and gave it to her sick little brother Edwin as an effort to resolve the illness that he also had. However, sadly, Edwin died two months later of tuberculosis, which this is what all this was caused by. Pretty much the entire New England vampire scare was a big outbreak of tuberculosis. They didn't know what tuberculosis was and why it was killing people. Also, her body was likely not decomposing just because she was buried in a crypt above the ground in freezer-like conditions, so. Connecticut. We have the Melon Heads of Connecticut. So apparently there's this story about legendary beings that live in the forest of Michigan, Connecticut, and Ohio, if Ohio exists. And it's basically about these creatures that look remotely human, but they have these gigantic bulbous looking melon heads. There's a couple variations of this myth. One more popular one that I like is that in Fairfield County, Connecticut, there was a insane asylum for the criminally insane, and that it burned down back in 1960, resulting in the death of all the staff and most of the patients. However, story goes that 10 to 20 of the asylum patients survived and escaped into the woods and that the melon heads are actually a result of these people going into the woods and trying to figure out how to survive, so they resort to cannibalism in order to survive, and they inbreeded, which caused them to develop hydrocephalus, which is where you have swelling in the brain. So basically there's these inbred cannibals that are eating people, according to the story. There's another variation of the story uh, about the melon heads are descendants of a colonial era family that was banished due to accusations of witchcraft, and also, like the other story, they were inbreeding and it caused swelling. Um, and they also cannibalized people because they were dumb. I also read this thing that it's so well known that some people who pass through Fairfield County, Connecticut drive really fast because they fear they'll be attacked by the melon heads. Which I don't think people in that area actually do that. New York. We have New York Champ. Some people call this the Loch Ness Monster of the United States. Champ or Champy is the name given to a reputed lake monster living in Lake Champlain in New York. There's been over 300 reported sightings of this monster. The legend of the monster draws tourism to Burlington, Vermont, and Plattsburgh, New York areas. Like the Loch Ness Monster, most people regard Champ as a legend, but others speculate that it's possibly a surviving plesiosaur. Probably a plesiosaur. The history behind the legend actually comes from centuries ago when the Iroquois people told legends about giant snakes in the area. 
In 1819, Captain Crumb of the ship Balagua Bay saw a black monster that stretched 187 feet long. According to him, the monster had a head like a seahorse, eyes the color of peeled onions, and three teeth with a star in the middle of its forehead. The most recent report took place in 2005 when a fisherman allegedly got pictures of a plesiosaur-like animal opening and closing its mouth. When the FBI forensics analyzed this photo, they said it looked authentic, but it didn't look like an animal to them, it was just a log. Sad. There's also a village in Port Henry, New York that actually still celebrates Champ Day where they erect this giant model of Champ. I really need to go there. New Jersey. This one's really creepy. It's called the Jersey Devil. It's pretty popular. I'm sure you've heard of it. According to the legend, when a woman in 1736 found out she was going to have her 13th kid, she got really upset. She cursed her unborn child, saying that it was going to be the devil. Whoopsies. When the time came for her to give birth, the child came out normal, but then suddenly changed into this hooved creature with a goat head, bat wings, and a forked tail. Then it flew up the chimney into the woods. Some versions of the story say that the mother was actually a witch and that the child's father was the devil himself, while other story claim that the haunting of this creature in the woods was so bad that they had a pastor attempt to exorcise the Pine Barrens area in New Jersey. The legend also says the Jersey devil glows and can breathe fire or poison from its breath which are both classic dragon characteristics. There's been many alleged sightings throughout the 1900s, and it's said the Jersey Devil still haunts New Jersey to this day. Delaware, we have the Selbyville Swamp Monster. Back in the 1920s, people started to report hearing screams at night out in the swamps of Delaware. People also began claiming that they had been chased by a huge hairy creature. 40 years later, in 1964, there was all of a sudden a massive amount of sightings of this creature, and people were freaking out because everybody was seeing it. Later, it was discovered that a local resident named Fred Stevens, who had grown up hearing the stories of the swamp monster back in the 20s, actually was dressing up and running through the woods in order to help sell newspapers for his friend, which worked really well. And he said that he had to stop pretending to be the monster because so many people started to hunt him in the woods and he almost got shot. Which is a good reason to stop. Pennsylvania, we have the Squonk. So the Squonk is a mythical creature that's said to live in the hemlock forest of northern Pennsylvania. This is another creature that's known as a fearsome critter that came from folklore stories told by lumberjacks. The Squonk is said to be completely miserable. It's said to look like this pig looking thing with misfitting skin. Uh, be absolutely covered in warts and moles and be so ashamed of its appearance that it hides from plain sight all the time and said to spend most of its time weeping because of how ugly it is. Legend has it that if it's cornered, it can dissolve itself into tears to escape being captured. He's a really sad boy. Maryland, we have Chessie, another sea monster. Chessie is said to live in Chesapeake Bay, where sightings have appeared in local media since 1936. The first sighting was actually by a military helicopter pilot that said something reptilian and unknown was in the water of Bush River. It's been described by onlookers as being a serpent-like creature that's about 25 to 40 feet long, having flippers and then swimming like a snake through the water. There's even footage that many people believe was the monster that was taken in 1980. Some people believe this legend came from seeing an oarfish, which is totally possible because or fish were thought to be sea monsters until recently. It was only discovered in 1772, which is fairly recent as far as animal discoveries go. But they can be 26 feet long and look very similar to a giant sea serpent. But I mean, really, they are sea monsters. Like, people categorize these animals that are, you know, fish or whatever. But I mean, it's a sea monster. I mean, look at this thing. That's crazy. And that's all the Northeast states. Moving to the last group, the Southeast. West Virginia one of the most famous cryptids in the world, Mothman. So Mothman has quite the following, and for good reason in my opinion. He's actually more of a worldwide phenomenon than just a myth from one state, and I'll explain why. 
Mothman's first sighting was in Point Pleasant, West Virginia in 1966. The local newspaper ran a story about a couple who saw a man-sized bird creature while driving home at night. They described it as being 7 feet tall with large red eyes and a 10 foot wingspan. They said it followed their car and even flew as fast as 100 miles an hour because they were in a car trying to outrun it. And at one point it got in front of their car and laid down in the road like it was hoping that they would get out and investigate it. Which they didn't do because they thought it was a trap. They eventually got away from it and came back later that night with the sheriff only to find a strange lump of dust where they claimed the creature had laid down in front of their car. After this sighting, there was at least a hundred Mothman reports, which many skeptics believe was sightings of sandhill cranes or great horned owls. But that doesn't explain what happened next. A journalist named John Keel, who was investigating the sightings, claimed that he was receiving telepathic messages from Mothman somehow, and that he got a warning about a regional blackout that was going to occur. What's really crazy is when the time came for the blackout to occur, the power stayed on, but the bridge right next to them in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, called Silver Bridge, collapsed, killing 46 people, and the sightings of Mothman then suddenly stopped. Leading up to this tragedy, many of the eyewitnesses reported during Mothman's year-long visit, they too felt an impending sense of doom. So that was in 1960. That was the first documented incident. In 2007, another bridge collapse would be linked to Mothman. Reports of Mothman sightings flooded in shortly before the collapse of the I-37 West Mississippi River Bridge in Minnesota. And the incident was eerily similar to the other collapse. 13 people died, 145 were injured, and witnesses said they saw a creature for months near the bridge and they said it was 10 feet in wingspan and had red eyes. So these were two incidences where Mothman was repeatedly seen in areas immediately before disaster strikes in the United States. But there's another very similar incident that occurred in Germany with a very similar creature. Sightings of what many called the Freiburg Schrecker occurred in Freiburg, Germany in 1978, when one morning a group of miners were going back to work to the mouth of their mine when they found a man in a trench coat blocking their path. When they approached him, they realized it wasn't a man, but an entity with large bat-like wings that looked like a coat. The creature then shrieked so loud that the miner said it sounded like 50 men screaming at once combined with the sound of a train's emergency brakes. And the men were terrified and ran away. Reasonable. One hour later, the mine that they were heading to work into collapsed and authorities said that if they had been in there working, they all would have died. For some reason, one third of the miners later developed serious mental disorders which is a fate that is shared by Mothman witnesses around the world. Now I have one more Mothman incident, the Fukushima nuclear power plant disaster of 2011. Just days after the tsunami, following the earthquake, reports of seeing Mothman, or Mothman-like creature, began to spread across the internet. The sightings were mainly near or around the Fukushima power plant. One night, two men who were working at the power plant after the earthquake went outside where they started to hear loud shrieking sounds. They started looking around and they noticed a large creature sitting on one of the power plant's buildings. They said that it spread its wings which were 10 feet wide and started doing circles around the buildings that were housing the nuclear reactors that would melt down just weeks later. Then they said it swooped down at them multiple times and when it flew past them they felt an overwhelming feeling of dread and a terrible fear that they shouldn't be there. Just weeks later, the Fukushima nuclear disaster occurred, forcing 150,000 people to evacuate. So this is a very strange incident. Some question if Mothman is there to help us, if he's there to hurt us, or if he's just there to feed off of human tragedy. Or if he's just now. Virginia, we had the Snally Gaster. In the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, in the 1930s, a large area was settled almost solely by Germans. Early accounts here describe the community as being terrorized by a monster called the Schneiler Geist, which meant quick spirit in German. A long time later, in 1909, reports of a strange flying beast called the Snallygaster started to occur in Frederick County, Virginia. And then suddenly there were sightings all over in West Virginia, Ohio, New Jersey, and there was even footprints found in the snow. The first person to see it was James Harding, and he described it having enormous wings, a long, sharp beak, claws like steel, and one eye in the middle of its forehead. 
He said it made a shrill screeching noise and looked like a cross between a tiger and a vampire. Which a vampire may have been a good description for it because it actually was reported to kill a man named Bill Jefferson by piercing his neck with its sharp beak and slowly sucking his blood. It was also said in West Virginia it attempted to capture a woman, but after failing to grab her, it instead roosted on a nearby barn and laid an egg. Which is a good compromise. Which it was later said that some men in West Virginia had rigged up an incubator and was trying to hatch the egg for some reason, but there's no info on what happened with that. It was also said that it was seen in Maryland where it was shot at by the locals there, uh, who also said it laid another big egg that was so big that it could hatch an elephant. Sightings of the Snallygaster were so big at the time that people were saying that President Theodore Roosevelt might postpone his trip he had to Europe to lead an expedition to capture the creature. And apparently the Smithsonian was also interested in the Snallygaster after hearing about the egg situation in West Virginia. It was so widely believed in that they recorded in detail descriptions of the Snallygaster for scientific purposes from the residents who had seen the beast. The death of the Snallygaster was also extremely eventful. The creature was flying near Frog Hollow in Maryland when it was attracted by the smell of 2,500 gallons of moonshine. So the beast flew over the moonshine and it was overcome by the fumes and it ended up dropping into a boiling vat of that moonshine. Where shortly after some federal agents showed up and their job was to destroy the moonshine, um, but they were surprised to find the dead monster in the boiling vat. However, according to the legend, they still went ahead and blew it up with 500 pounds of dynamite, uh, which destroyed all the remains of the Snallygaster. <sighs> so sad. Kentucky, we had the Kelly Little Green Men. Also known as the Hopkinsville Encounter or the Hopkinsville Goblins Case, this incident was a series of connected incidences of alleged close encounters with presumably extraterrestrial beings. And I didn't know this till I started doing more research about it, but apparently this event inspired the movie E.T. and the creation of the Pokemon Sableye and the denizens in Call of Duty Black Ops 2 Transit, those little things that would like, if you would jump out of the bus and you would run out where you're not supposed to, they would start attacking you. They were the worst. So back to the story, there was a dozen of eyewitnesses of these little green men, which included two families present at a farmhouse and then other civilians in the area who had no connection to the families. The most significant witness also included several local policemen and a state trooper who saw and heard strange phenomenon such as unexplained lights in the night sky and noises the same night. The seven people present in the farmhouse when the main event happened claimed that they were terrorized by an unknown number of creatures that were similar to gremlins, which are now referred to as the Hopkinsville Goblins in popular culture. The residents of the farmhouse described them as being three feet tall, having these upright pointy ears, thin limbs, long arms, and claw-like hands with talons. The creatures were silvery in color and wore something metallic, and their movement seemed to defy gravity as if they were floating above the ground and they were appearing in high places and they walked in like a, with a swaying motion like they were wading through water. Although these creatures never entered the farmhouse, they would pop up in the windows and in the doorways and they woke the children up in the house in a hysteric frenzy. The families got so freaked out that they fled the farmhouse in the middle of the night to the local police station and the sheriff, Russell Greenwell, noted that they were visibly shaken. The families then returned to the farmhouse with the sheriff and 20 officers, where the police saw evidence of a huge struggle, damages to the house, as well as seeing strange lights and hearing noises themselves. The witnesses from the farmhouse also claimed that they had to use firearms to shoot the creatures, but they had no effect and the house in the surrounding area was just extensively damaged by their shootout. They had a rough night. So I guess they pretty much destroyed their entire house. Anyways, moving on to Tennessee, we had the Tennessee Wild Man. So according to folklore, during the 1800s in McNary County, Tennessee, a circus had a show that was displaying this creature that was like a Sasquatch, but that it was more human-like. However, this creature was said to break free from its cage and escape into the hills of Tennessee. He was described as being seven feet tall, having dark gray hair, and having piercing red eyes. Also said to have a horrible war cry that sounded similar to the skunk ape, which I'll get into in a little bit. 
It said that the monster had a strange obsession with targeting dogs and women. Many women have allegedly almost been captured by this wild man, uh, but they've always escaped somehow. Not a whole lot more stuff to say about him, except that there was these two guys who apparently ran into him like 20 years ago in Tennessee in the mountains. But yeah, that would make the creature like 150 years old, so probably not. North Carolina, we have the Vampire Beast, or the Beast of Bladenboro. So this is another monster with vampiric qualities. It's been said to have killed several livestock and pets in Bladenboro, North Carolina in the 1950s. During a span of 10 days, it was attributed with killing four dogs, three hogs, some cows, and one goat. It was also said to drain the blood of all of its kills. It had a sighting where there was a woman outside who saw the creature coming towards her, but just before it could get her, she ran inside. But this beast left these cat-like footprints, which people picked up on and ended up going to hunt it. So the town banded together in Bladenboro. Uh, the children couldn't leave the house, and all the men stormed the forest with guns to find and kill this creature. But after a large bobcat was killed by a hunter, they decided that they were satisfied and they just ended the search. However, later on in 2007, some say the beast returned because they found 60 goats with their blood drained and their heads crushed. And then a little ways closer to Bladenboro, another farmer lost his goats in the exact same way. In other places in the area, lost a grand total of 10 dogs in just two weeks in 2007. They also found footprints that were four inches across. But after this 2007 incident, nothing has happened lately. South Carolina, we have the Lizard Man of Scape or Swamp. This is another creature that has its roots in Native American mythology, as there was a Cree legend that took place in modern day Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina area about a human sized lizard monster. The first modern reported sighting was in 1987 by a 17 year old local named Christopher Davis. Davis said he encountered the creature while he was driving home from work at 2 a.m. According to his account, he stopped on the road bordering Scape or Swamp in order to change a blown out tire. But when he was finishing up his tire, he reported having heard thumping noises from behind him. And after turning around to see what it was, he saw a creature running towards him. Davis said that the creature tried to grab at the car and jumped on the roof as he tried to escape, clinging onto it so tightly that Davis had to swerve around on the side of the road to try to throw it off. He said it had glowing red eyes that he saw from 25 feet away and had three big fingers with long black nails and green rough skin. In the month that followed the Davis sighting, there was several further reports of a lizard-like creature and also unusual scratches and bite marks found on cars that were parked close to Scape or Swamp. The local sheriff's department even got a plaster mold of the three toed footprints, but they decided not to send them into the FBI uh, because the biologist said that they would be unclassifiable, so. The sightings attracted tourists interested in seeing this creature, and the nearby radio station called WCOS offered a $1 million reward to anybody who could capture this creature alive. However, reports of this creature began to decline, and so did the popularity. So, nothing's happened with it. It looks kinda like a slee stack from uh, Land of the Lost. Arkansas, we have the Falk Monster, also known as the Boggy Creek Monster, or the Swamp Stalker, it's been the subject of two popular documentaries. And when I say popular, I just mean like popular as in popular for being local. The most famous sighting was in 1970 when a local Arkansas family was being terrorized, allegedly, by a seven foot tall ape-like creature that was similar to Bigfoot, but it had blackish red fur and three toes. Two men from the family had had enough so they went out to chase it away, and after pursuing it, they ended up shooting it twice, but then they realized that there was another falk monster back at their house trying to get inside to their women. The men were able to get back to their house and protect their ladies, and after this incident, there was many reports of a similar three-toed ape-man thing around Arkansas and Texas areas, and honestly, I'm not sure how they were able to do two documentaries on these creatures, because honestly, I couldn't find hardly anything about it other than what I just said. Moving on. Louisiana, we've got the Rougarou, also known as the Cajun Critter or the Loop Guru. This is a legend about a shape-shifting monster that lives in the swamps of Louisiana. So the history is a little wonky. Basically, the idea came from medieval France where they used to have like witch trials where they would put people on trial for witchcraft. 
but at the same time they would also have these witch hunts for werewolves uh, where they would call these people loop gurus which meant werewolf in French I believe. Later a bunch of these French dudes migrated to Canada and then down to Louisiana which is why there's a bunch of French culture down there. So in these Cajun legends the creature is said to prowl the swamps around the greater New Orleans area and be around the sugarcane fields and in the woodlands regions. The Rougarou is most often described as being a creature with a human body and having the head of a wolf or a dog, similar to the werewolf legend. Often this story was told to children to make them obey and not wander off at night, but according to another version, the wolf-like beast will hunt down and kill Catholics who don't follow the rules of Lent. Along with this version of the legend, it's also said that someone turns into a Rougarou if they break the rules of Lent seven years in a row. But the common legend says that the Rougarou is under a spell for 101 days, and after that time is passed, the curse is transferred from one person to the last person that the Rougarou bit, where the past Rougarou then turns back into a human. Other stories talk about the Rougarou being derived from witchcraft, in which they claim that only a witch can turn people into a Rougarou, either by turning the witch herself into a Rougarou or cursing others to be one. All right, we got Mississippi with the Pascagoula Elephant Men. Also known as the Pascagoula River Aliens, there was an abduction. So the Pascagoula alien abduction occurred in 1973 when two co-workers claimed to be abducted by aliens while fishing near the Pascagoula River in Mississippi. And this was an extremely famous incident. It's regarded as one of the best known claims of alien abduction. To summarize, while some guys were fishing the Pascagoula River in Southern Mississippi, they claimed that a 40 foot long egg shaped UFO descended onto them and then three alien dudes started to float towards them from the ship. They described the creatures as being roughly humanoid in shape and standing at about five feet tall. The creature's skin was pale and wrinkled like an elephant. They had no eyes and slits for mouths. The beings also had these lobster-like claws at the end of their arms and elephant-like feet. They reported that the creatures moved mechanically, kind of like a robot. And they go on about how they were taken into the ship and that they were actually probed, but they weren't probed by the alien creatures, but by a very human looking lady. Then they were placed back on the fishing bank unharmed after it was all done. This was so weird because they were completely sober when this incident happened, uh, but there's no proof at all that it did happen at all. So, Alabama, white thing. Alabama has this legend about something they call White Thing. There's almost no info about it, but I'll tell you what I got. Basically, there's several accounts of seeing a very large white creature in Alabama, but witnesses all describe it differently. Many report seeing a seven foot tall creature like Bigfoot with white hair, while others describe seeing a white lion or even a white humanoid alien figure close to caves. It's known for its ability to move extremely quickly and its eerie screech kind of like a woman's scream. Many have speculated that it's an albino Bigfoot or perhaps a albino bear, uh, but there's even a whole Facebook group for it if you want to join it. Georgia, we have the Altamaha Ha. Also known as Alti, this is a sea monster that's been sighted in the Altamaha River in southern Georgia. This is also another creature that came from Native American mythology, as Alti the sea monster has been talked about by the local Tama Native American tribe in the state of Georgia for hundreds of years, or a monster similar to it has been talked about. Alti is described as having a sturgeon-like body with a bony ridge on the top of its back, front flippers, and no back limbs like a dolphin, also sometimes having a snout like a crocodile. Some people got really excited in 2018 because they had really thought that they had found one, uh, and it looked really convincing. Uh, but it was found out to be a stuffed shark mixed with paper mache. Okay, the last one. Thank you guys for sticking around. We have the Skunk Ape of Florida. This is one of my favorites. This is a good one. Once again, this is another Sasquatch Gigantopithecus-like creature. Some people call it the Florida Bigfoot. It's a bipedal humanoid that's had over 300 alleged sightings, and it's said to inhabit the forest and swamps of the southeast region of the United States, including Texas, Georgia, Louisiana, but most notably the Florida Everglades. It's said to have black or reddish fur and glowing red eyes. Which is weird because when you look at these pictures, most primates have retinas that don't reflect light, so it makes you think that it's not a monkey. 
The skunk ape's most obvious characteristic is that it has a terrible odor which gives it the name skunk ape, obviously. One of the first reports was in 1818 when a newspaper in Apalachicola, Florida released a report that spoke of a man-sized monkey raiding food stores and stocking fishermen along the shores. One other alleged report came in the 1970s from two Palm City Beach sheriff deputies who reported a tall ape-like animal that was stalking them while they traveled through a grove, which they didn't get a good look at it, but according to the story, they just absolutely opened fire on it to make it go away. America. One big incident with the skunk ape was in the year 2000 when the Sarasota County Police Department received a letter from an anonymous woman. Included in the letter was two attached photographs from what the woman was saying was an escaped orangutan and she was complaining about how it was stealing apples off of her back porch for three nights. Which a lot of cryptid enthusiasts say that these pictures of this creature was definitely a skunk ape. Which is kind of interesting because its eyes reflected the light. Most sightings of the skunk ape can likely be dismissed as being a black bear, as black bear can stand up right and look kind of like a completely different animal. But there is this crazy video that this guy took in Mississippi titled, I think I saw the skunk ape, please help. And in this video it depicts a large hairy humanoid creature crouching in this water swampy area pulling bark off of a tree. And it's crazy, it's a crazy video, it looks really real. Many say that this is a skunk ape and it, it was pretty good footage, or it's right there. And that's it, that's all 50 states. Thank you guys so much for watching, I really enjoy doing this series, I'm glad I can make a whole big conglomerate video of all of it. Um, but seriously, thank you guys for 15,000 subs. Um, I didn't expect to hit it this quick. Um, but seriously, thank you guys. I'm going to be making more videos on here for sure. I'm trying to transition more off of TikTok, as I said before. Um, as you can see, I moved out of my basement, <laughs> which I was sad to do. But it was just, it's cold down there and the acoustics are really bad. Uh, so it'll be a lot easier to pump out videos up here. Like I can already tell it's... This, doing this video was significantly easier, but I'm definitely going to be doing more videos on here, so if you like this stuff, just keep coming. I'll keep making it. Thank you guys for watching, and have a great day.